bringing you a steady stream of thought-provoking ideas and cutting-edge innovation. You're listening to Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Well, welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited about the topic that Connor and I are going to be touching on today because I think this is something that every one of us faces at some point in our lives. And it's here's the question, Connor. What's the best way to change the world? Through a group effort or through individual effort? Uh, the best is subjective, right? Or maybe it's not, but that's what we're going to talk about today is trying to, fi- trying to find the most relevant and effective way that you can get involved. Brian and I have been very actively involved people And making a difference, you begin to crave it more and more. You begin to experiment with different ways. But what's interesting is you begin to attract to you other people who want to make a difference. And they say, well, hey, you're you're doing, you know, great with X. I want to do that too. Or I want to do something. How did you get to that point? What can I do to make a difference? And that is a question we get over and over because I think that sincere people, concerned citizens, as it were, want to use their the, the disposable time, the limited time they have, they want to make an impact. And so they want to know how they can you know, most effectively use that time. It's a very important question. But then, as you pointed out, the question is, should they go it alone, forge their own path, or do they join a group in some kind of mass movement? Well, how many times have you heard the words, united we stand, divided we fall? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's very common. In fact, you know, there are whole movements built around it. But uh, we're, we're going to think a little bit outside the box today and just hopefully examine that that premise of, you know, for things to get done, we've got to build this team, build this coalition, and then all of us together cannot fail. This is kind of unrelated, but you'll see what I mean here in a moment. I've heard a lot of recent criticisms, and probably they're well-founded, about like the Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure, you know, and these groups that do these big elaborate races and fundraising events. And the criticism is that these groups become uh, dependent on the revenue stream that only comes in because of the problem, that they're not, in fact, spending all of that investment, time, and energy on the, um, on the objective, on the goal. They're, they'll do that a little bit. They have to keep up you know, pretenses, or maybe they are really motivated, but they have, this, they have to sustain themselves. They have to keep this entire operation afloat because now jobs are on the line, and all, we can't let go of the staff. And so they have to keep that going. And that makes me think of these these mass movements that people join to make a difference. It becomes about the pretense of the goal, the change. But in reality, you end up with this um, this institutionalized self-perpetuation scheme where it's it's a it's almost like a pyramid scheme. Like give us money and give us your time. We have to keep this thing going. And I see a lot of people who join those movements end up getting burned out. I think the the temptation to join movements is is very strong. Because we see problems, and as an individual, I'm just going to speak for myself, I see problems out there that are clearly way too big for me alone to solve. Right. So I feel like, well, there's strength in numbers. If more people, if we, look, come on, if we all just pull together, if we all just have unity, (laughs) that's when we're going to get it done. Yeah. But historically, unity has been a very tricky thing. In fact, it's been kind of a double-edged sword. If If you really want to think about it, the worst atrocities, I'm talking the worst genocides committed in human history, Mm -hmm. wasn't unity at their base, as in you're either with us or we're going to get rid of you. And there's actually an even better word that I like to use for that. Not that it was these uh, mass uh, extinction events, mass mass death uh, was genocide per se, but in most cases, the largest instances were what's called democide, when people are killed by their own government. And those governments definitely fomented exactly what you're saying, that, oh, we have to be united, we have to be together in this, it's for the cause, it's for the children, Um, join us, rally, sign up, become a soldier, be a good taxpayer, go vote. And, And you're right, it's predicated on, come on, be part of the team. I'll use the example of China when they went through their cultural revolution under Mao. And I don't know if you've ever read the book Red Scarf Girl. Mm-mm. It's it's a great book. I recommend it to anybody who wants to have a bit of an insight into the shift that took place throughout Chinese culture. And it was so thorough that you had to divest yourself of every memory of the past. If you had nice furniture, you either had to get rid of it or you had to paint it or scar it up so it didn't look as nice because that flew in the face of that communist ideal of equality. Mm. And, and people who traditionally had kind of been on the outs and you know, the, 
the unaffiliated, the the nerds, if you will, the people who really didn't um, have a place, were sought out by the leadership to become informers and to become enforcers of the new attitudes. And you were not permitted to show any of the old attitudes or to, to even acknowledge that there had ever been anything other than that cultural revolution that was going on. And, I mean, they, they beat people. They, they took people away and put them in prison just for being out of step and not having unity. So the, the team effort, as you're pointing out with these examples, has tyrannical and, and very dangerous implications when taken to the extreme as world history provides ample um, evidence of occurring. Right. But I think you would concede, Brian, that in most cases, it doesn't get to that point. The, the issue we're talking about changing the world for the better. Right. And so, you know, people join these mass movements and sometimes they veer off into forbidden paths and end up, you know, with what you're talking about. But in many cases, they're, they're well intentioned. Let's use, for example, uh, the Tea Party. The problem with the Tea Party, as I saw it, as this began to happen, I actually wrote a blog post about this we'll link to on today's show notes page, which is societyinthestate.com slash 15, was that you had all these people joining this movement that were susceptible to being co-opted. When you see these mass movements of of well-intentioned people who want to make a difference, I mean, I knew so many people who aligned themselves with the Tea Party they wanted to affect change. They had lost hope that Congress would ever reform itself. They saw an opportunity to be part of something that could apply enough pressure to actually and for once affect positive change on Washington, D.C. They marched on Congress. They went to big rallies. They waved their signs and their flags and everything else. And it was intoxicating for a lot of these people who wanted to make a difference. They wanted to be part of something. And so they joined the Tea Party. But what you saw at the very beginning, I saw this early on because there was a Tea Party rally um, here where I live, and you saw congressional candidates, other political candidates, come and attend those rallies and say, hey, me too. Hey, I'll represent you. I agree with you. And even at the outset, you saw those seeking power trying to co-opt this movement for their own purposes. You saw organizations, nonprofits and for-profits coming out and saying, we represent the Tea Party. We are the Tea Party. We serve the Tea Party. Using this movement and the emotional connection that, that resonated with all of these people who affiliated themselves with the Tea Party for their own purposes. And what you see now is that there literally is no Tea Party. I mean, it just completely fizzled and went away. And so all of the people who got involved with the Tea Party, signed up, joined, called themselves a Tea Partier, they... they gave themselves an identity that now has no meaning. And what I found from my interactions with people who were very involved in the Tea Party is that most of them, the overwhelming majority of the ones that I know, are no longer involved in political issues in any significant way, right? Um, And I think it's because these people got burned out. They got disillusioned, and so they said, well, that didn't work. I give up. I got better things to do. It's the nature of mass movements. And and I'm painting with a broad brush here, but... Mass movements in general attract people, and they also fail because they offer what appears to be an easy solution to what is usually a pretty complex problem. And people, you know, and the Tea Party is a perfect example of this. There was a lot of frustration, and I think very well justified frustration. You know, these people weren't just making this up out of whole cloth. They had some very real concerns. But the promise of that, you know, well, we're going to fix this, and you, know, you put us in office and, and whatnot, and... The fast solutions are not ones that last. And so um, you'll find that more often than not, mass movements are doomed to failure because the wind shifts direction and and the crowd is very easy to manipulate. We've talked about how easy it is. You know, Edward Bernays um, in his his book, Propaganda, spoke of how easy it is to manipulate the masses. Individuals typically can be a little bit harder, especially if they're well-grounded and have a good idea of what they stand for and who they are. I think of it a little bit like homeschoolers. It's very difficult to think of yourself as the science teacher, the history teacher, the math teacher, the English teacher, you know, for your children. And so these parents end up being very stressed because they think that they have to be the know-it-all and they end up seeking off-the-shelf solutions. They want curriculum. Just give me a plug and play, right? I can't learn all this myself, relearn, <laughs> relearn all this myself because we once had to learn it. 
and, and regurgitate it to my children. I just want something that I can just put worksheets in front of. And so they want that crutch. They want the quick and easy way, the off-the-shelf solution to get up and running and be an effective homeschooler. And obviously this, there's other applications in our lives, whether you're a homeschooler or not. I think my point is clear. And, and it's what you said with the mass movements. is people wanting the easy way out, but that often ends up being the wrong, the wrong path forward. There's something about uh, when, when we call it groupthink. You've, you've heard that term. I like that term because I think it accurately describes when people start chanting, and you see this at demonstrations, hey, hey, ho, ho, whatever, whatever's got to go. Right. That is not rational, persuasive, world-changing thought that's taking place there. That's people coming together in unity, but they're at the same time kind of devolving to a more animal level. It seems to me that the the changes that really seem to have impact come when there is a person who makes the decision, Rosa Parks, I will not give up my seat. But it's an individual Mm -hmm. who acts on principle and and a sense of personal excellence and and suffers for it, generally. They don't get by unscathed, but that's what seems to shift the needle in the proper direction. I almost wonder, going back to what you said earlier about their strength in numbers, and, and you're right. I mean, that's a very valid point. And so we want to join, you know, lock arms with other people like us to say, hey, let's do this together. And so there is strength in numbers. That's a very real temptation to do the more mass movement style of trying to change the world. But I think it's also using your example about how the individuals end up suffering. Not only is there strength in numbers, there's safety in numbers. And people who don't have a thick skin or who are worried about, you know, being targeted or having uh, retaliation of any sort, they want to be kind of lost in the crowd. Oh, I'll, I'll go to that rally, but you know, I won't hold up a sign. You know, they just, they want to be part of it, but they don't want to suffer the consequences of any potential backlash. And so it's hard. And for that reason, you probably don't see a lot of individuals standing up. No, but the ones who do really can make a difference. Um, I, I look at uh, Albert Nock. And for people who aren't familiar with him, Albert Nock lived in the early part of the 20th century, uh, wrote a lot of really great books, among them Our Enemy, the State. And to, to sum up Nock's philosophy, he was much more in favor of what he called one improved unit. He says, if you want to improve society, then what you do is you offer society one improved unit, by which he meant the person you see looking back at you from the mirror. You improve that person. You become the best person you can, and you will measurably improve society. All right, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Okay. Um, that's a cop-out, right? Because that's like the easy answer. Well, of course, you know, oh, it's the Gandhi quote, like, be the change you wish to see in the world, right? And I'm, I'm arguing against myself because I think this is a completely valid point. But for purposes of discussion— that, that's just, I mean, that sounds lame, right? Like people want to get out there and change the world and, and they want to make a difference. They want to leave a legacy and an impact and they want to change people's minds. They don't want to just take some self-improvement course and read a book, right? So, so argue your case. Why am I wrong? How many people have you tried to change? I mean, to argue, persuade, how, how easy is it to change other people, to change their minds? How much power do you have to, to control other people. Uh, hardly any. Yeah. And that's what Nock was getting at. But here's the thing. Um, he, I think he referred to it as, uh, no, it was Mencken actually who referred to it as a messianic mindset that comes over people when they start to attach themselves to a, a mass movement. Well, this is the movement that's going to make it all happen because look at all of us together. This many people, safety in numbers. How could we all be wrong? Right. And yet at the same time, um, when when masses come together and there's that sense of unity to the point where if you're not with us, you're against us, Right. that's when really bad stuff tends to happen. I mean, any riot tends to, to grow on that principle. And it's the idea that no individual snowflake feels responsible for the avalanche. Hey, I'm just here. I'm just, you know, I'm just doing my thing, sure. getting carried along with all the other snowflakes. So <laughs> it, it, it takes strength to be that one improved unit. But um, Leonard Reed talked about uh, there, there's a kind of gravity that develops around us when we are sincerely trying to improve ourselves. And, and I'm talking primarily character, okay? I mean, it's not like, oh, I'll work out, I'll become, you know, very aerodynamic and very fit. People see the kind of life you live, they see the kind of character that you have, and there's an illumination of sort that, uh, that seems to come from that. And you'll know that this is happening in your life when people start to approach you and say, 
could you tell me about this? Or I have some questions about that. You'll know you're doing it right. There's, there's this psychological idea of like the copycat principle where you see like criminals who will do something and then you get the copycat crimes. Uh, someone commits suicide or there's a, a newspaper story about a suicide and then suicides in that region where that newspaper is printed um, have a statistically significant increase, you know, in the weeks that follow. And it's almost like um, doing something different inspires change. Now that can be bad <laughs> change like killing yourself or robbing a store, but it can also inspire positive change when you're almost giving permission to people to say, look, I'm doing this. You can do it too. I'm trying to be a better person. I'm trying to do my civic duty. I'm trying to, you know, read a book a week. It, it gives other people the signal that if that guy can do it, I can do it too. Or like, oh, hey, I never thought about that. The mere fact that you posted that on Facebook, that that's what you're doing, it, it inspired me to try and do the same thing. And so you're leading by example in many cases by not even intentionally doing so. You're going about your business trying to do your part individually. Now, here's the rub. It's almost like this, this converse thing that I can't get out of my mind. So we're kind of arguing against mass movements a little bit, uh, the dangers that are inherent in mass movements and for individuals. And yet there's such a powerful economic principle in division of labor, right? We have to be interdependent. If we try and do everything on our own, we will fail. We will live at a, sub a subsistence level. We need other people. We need to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Otherwise, we can't go to the grocery store and have 80 types of potato chips to choose from, right? Right. And so we need this division of labor. Everyone's doing something different. We're all working together. In effect, we're part of this mass movement of sorts called the economy. And so you, let's, you mentioned Leonard Reed, right? Our listeners will probably recall him as the author of the uh, famous essay, I Pencil, the autobiography of a pencil, how it's made as an illustration of uh, how the market works, right? And there's no pencil czar. There's no president of pencil production. There's no mass movement for increasing the pencil supply in the world. And yet we have pencils. And so you have division of labor. You have, of sorts, this mass movement. I wonder, Brian, if the, the difference we're driving at here is that all of the people down the supply chain of the pencil production, they're not part of a pencil movement. They're just a guy that's, you know, mining or, or they're just a logger and that's all they are. And that's, that's their job. Or they're the farmer or they're the, you know, the facility manager at, on the production line to produce the chainsaws that loggers use to cut down the trees for pencils. And so everyone is acting individually, doing their own thing, whatever interests them, whatever their talents are, that's what they're focused on. The logger is trying to figure out how to be a faster logger at a cheaper price to outcompete the other loggers and win more business. He doesn't. He may hate pencils. He's not part of a pencil movement, right? He's not going to pencil parades and rallies. So he's part of a vast movement, but the individual incentive is there. It, he's not tying himself to this collective identity. There's there's a phrase that describes what what you or that uh, defines what what you've just been describing here, and it's called disinterestedness. You ever heard that word before? I don't think so. Okay, this Jonah or uh, Josiah Bunting was uh, he was the commandant of one of the military premier military schools. Maybe, I think maybe it was West Point, but he wrote a book called An Education for Our Time. And specifically what he was addressing there was we need more disinterested leaders. And that was the education he was advocating for. By disinterested, he meant people who are not distracted by trying to win awards, by trying to get uh, time in the spotlight, um, who aren't distracted just by mere money. People who are living with purpose, but they're doing it in such a way that it's, it's having great impact on the world around them, but they're not doing it for the accolades that, that others might do. And I, I, it can apply to, it could apply to politics. It could apply to a particular trade. It could apply to almost any area of your life. Hmm. That disinterested attitude just simply means that uh, you're, you're striving for excellence, but you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And not because, uh, you know, there's going to be a big payoff. Somebody's going to approach me and want to do a movie about my life or something. It also makes me think of that we each have our own unique abilities. And the danger in collectivism is that you homogenize the group. In other words, there's no uniqueness. It's the Borg, right? We will yeah. add your uniqueness to our own, right? And they end up suppressing the uniqueness. It goes away in, in favor of not just the common good, but really the lowest common denominator. 
And so like when I have people approach me and say, oh, hey, you've, you've figured out how to do, you know, this, that, or the other. I really want to do something like that. You know, how, how can I be a part of it? How can I do what you're doing? How can I help you? And unless I feel prompted otherwise, my general reply is don't, right? My path is my own. My skill set is very unique. And most people can't do what I do as well as I do. That's not a criticism of other people. And it's not boasting. It's just that I figured out my niche. And everyone has their own. And maybe it is doing what I'm doing. Maybe it's doing kind of a part or a different flavor or on a different issue. But in most cases, my experience is that other people have different callings in life, different paths to follow, different strengths, different weaknesses. And if what they see is a Brian Hyde or a Connor Boyack or an Edward Snowden or someone else that they want to be like and they want to do the same things, in many ways, they're just trying to start their own new little mass movement you know, of two and then three and then four. It's like, well, wait a minute. Let's analyze what matters to you, what you're good at. What's the path that is unique to you that you're supposed to follow? And that's where the individual path has to be the focus. Don't tie yourself to a mass movement. It defeats the purpose. If I were to come to you and say, Connor, I want to take charge of my life. Can you tell me how to do that? (laughs) It's it's, it's totally, no, you shouldn't have to. Um, Paul Rosenberg wrote about this some time ago. He had an essay about uh, the power of numbers. And in his essay was actually United We Fall. But he said, when you have a mass movement following what he calls a noble leadership, in quotation marks, he says that's when individual level virtues are squeezed out and actual improvement along with it. And these are the examples that he gives. He says, listening to the leader in a mass movement displaces your self-judgment. Following the leader displaces your self-motivation. Lauding the courage of the leader displaces your own courage to act alone. And he says, quoting the words of the leader displaces your self-responsibility. Wow, That's powerful, isn't it? That's powerful. Let's link to that. So that'll be on societyinthestate.com slash 15. Um, I I think of someone like Henry. I mean, there's so many examples of people who on their own initiative led out and made an impact. We're talking about not just improving your life to be a better father. I mean, we're talking about changing the world, right? And the assertion we're making is that the best way to do that is individuals acting on their own that in the aggregate, when you have many people doing that with their unique skill sets and paths to follow and everything else, um, the world is going to be changed for the better because you won't have the the negative um, implications and the potential for co-opting these mass movements that can be, you know, spun off and taken over and, you know, money siphoned off or whatever, right? The individuals acting alone, it's very hard to co-opt an Edward Snowden or a Gandhi Right, because they're set, they're focused. Um, people expect a certain thing from them. They're very consistent, usually. And so I think of like Henry David Thoreau. Here's a guy who was living at Walden Pond, uh, living transcendentalism, this kind of off the grid experiment of just you know being one with nature or whatever. And uh, and the tax collector confronts him. The Mexican American War is going on at the time, to which Thoreau objected. And that was back in the days when taxes were for specific things. Right now, it's all pooled together. And so if you object to policy X or you know, abortion or whatever, you, you can't readily identify the tax connected with that issue you protest. But he could. He objected to the Mexican-American War. He effectively told the tax collector to pound sand, and he was thrown in jail. He was there, I believe, only for one night. Uh, his, it was his mother or his sister, some relative, freed him from jail over his protestations, he, he objected to being released. It was part of his life experiment. And it was really interesting. This was the basis for him later writing the essay called Civil Disobedience, which you can readily find available online. But here's the guy who was acting consistent with his beliefs. He wrote about it. He opined about the, the issue, this, this leadership of acting consistent with your beliefs, even when it's in contradiction to the quote-unquote laws. And this essay has given such thought leadership to so many people, including Gandhi. I mean, here's the guy who was upheld as like the, the, the beacon, the star of civil disobedience and inspiring his own mass movement in a way, right? At least a lot of followers. But a, a man who acted individually, consistently, who wanted to set an example and affect change. He is the, the person whose quote I shared about be the change you wish to see in the world, of course. 
And he points to Thoreau as the example. And so it's the power that an individual can do when they're acting of their own accord. And like you said with that quote from Rosenberg, not su- subordinating themselves to someone else's thoughts or opinions or actions. There's a place for unity. Team sports. You want your football team to be you know, united. If, if you're sending bodies to war, if you're going to go out and, and confront an opposing army on the battlefield, yes, you want unity in those kind of things. We don't want to lose. No, exactly. There's a, it, so don't take this as a blanket indictment of there should never be any unity. However, if you want to move the world in some appreciable way for the better, you've got to be willing to make your legs start moving, not wait for somebody to give you permission, not wait for some leader to come along and say, follow me and I'll show you the way you know to do this. You've got to choose for yourself. Take responsibility, make your own decisions. And until you can do that, you won't move the world forward by any appreciable amount. Okay, well, as someone who in his own way is trying to change the world, I hope that all of our listeners can take away from this validation to not feel the urge to you know, jump on board ship with, with anyone else. Uh, maybe this is the whole cat herding mentality of the broader liberty movement where everyone's kind of doing their own thing and it's very hard to control, but that's good. We don't want to be controlled or co-opted. We want to have a strong group of people who are asserting themselves, improving themselves, being an example to the world around us. Um, Next episode, we are talking to a gentleman who fits this bill. And so make sure you are subscribed. You will not want to miss this conversation. It's with Patrick Byrne, who is the CEO of Overstock, uh, a guy who has been fighting Wall Street, a philosopher in his own right, and a super interesting dude um, that you are going to want to listen to. And so join us next time. Show notes page for today is societyinthestate.com slash 15. This has been a great uh, conversation, Brian, with you. I think there's a lot to take away from this that I'm going to continue to pour over as well. Guys, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com.